what's up? So, the kid, I am back, and this is the other side of the sun podcast. And today, I have the lovely Yasmin Hendrix. Not only does she have one of my favorite surnames in music, she is an <laughs> vocalist, writer, trumpeter, looper. Yeah, yeah, one is of that those. A word, a looper. Yeah. <laughs> Loop artist, Looper. Looper. Yeah, yeah. Probably, yeah, probably one of the best vocals I have heard around. Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind of you to say. Yeah, well, <laughs> of course. And uh, we're just going to have a chat about, you know, uh, stuff, music, life, life, where you're at, COVID and all this stuff. Being yeah. Like, oh, What's that been like? Should we start? Actually, yeah, let's, let's um, introduce yourself and then let's, uh, let's uh, go for it. Oh, I think you did a very good job, but um, yeah. yeah, I'm Yasmin Hendrix. I'm a, I'm a living being, human uh, <laughs> on this planet. You know, we are all just the same at our core. Um, we really are. Um, but what makes me different <laughs> from everyone else on the planet is, yeah, I do some looping, I, I sing, I songwrite. I used to play trumpet and then I had a long break and now I'm just coming back into it. So I still that kind of don't back see into myself. It. <laughs> what put me back into it? Did I force you back into it with a uh, <laughs> trumpet solo? I mean, so <laughs> many people forced me back into it. And like, the thing is, when I gave up trumpet, like I put my trumpet down because I wanted to focus on singing for a while. So when I did that, I like, I knew there would be a day where I would say, cool, I want to really get back into trumpet again. Do you know what I mean? And it's, it's never been something that is like, really left me you know because it was that's the first instrument I fell in love with so a lot of the time even when I'm like thinking of a melody I'll be like doing the vowels or the trumpet yeah that's that's it's like, weird that you say that trumpet. yeah no it's, it's weird that it, no it's it's actually amazing that you say oh. that because I was talking <laughs> to Marissi about that and oh, you were real. showing me some of uh, big up Marissi um that's actually yeah, how we met <laughs> uh, you were showing me some of the stuff that you guys were working on your EP together and I was like literally because I only found out that you played trumpet when you did that solo for me on the track we did together. Yeah. And yeah. then when when he played me that stuff, I was like, it's because she plays trumpet. Those those melodies, like <laughs> someone who plays trumpet, like the way you riff and the way you sing, like even when I think back to the older stuff you did with Marissi, I was like, nah, definitely. Where does this come from? Yeah, I know. Definitely. It's funny. I like Ella Fitzgerald is one of my favorite singers and she has a quote, which I love. And maybe I'm going to get it like slightly wrong, but basically it says, everything I ever sung, I stole from the horns. Ah. And I just love that line because I feel like, you know, it's true. When, when, if you, if you play, like I played when I was a child and when I was a teenager growing up and I played in like jazz bands and I played in like symphony orchestras and we got to like travel and it was like, it was a, it, honestly an amazing experience to be in that kind of environment so young. But yeah, it, I, I think of things in terms of trumpet sometimes. That's like top line, isn't it, basically? What's that? The horn section, I mean, the, the trumpets and stuff. That's like top line, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so it all, all, all connect. It all goes hand in hand. Sick. Yeah, it's nice picking it back up again, but I'm still not quite there. But yeah, it's been exciting kind of doing trumpet for p other people's songs. I'm like, oh, I'm playing trumpet on that song. <laughs> It, it honestly like it it's exciting to me yeah, but you're good though man i'm all right i'm getting back to it <laughs> yeah i would have thought i mean hanging around ronnie scott's and all these places <laughs> on stage, I know. holding but the horn in one hand and singing like, in the other hand you know it's so intimidating though because like i feel like you know a real great like if, if trumpet is your first instrument you are dedicated you have to play every day you have to keep your lips up you have to like you know, that stamina and that like constant practice, that dedication to your craft. Mm. Places like Ronnie Scott's, you see people who literally dedicate their whole yeah. life to their craft yeah. and it is intimidating, you know? So like, I look at myself as a trumpet player and I'm like, I'm not even a trumpet player. You know? yeah. No, <laughs> I, I completely like, get that. Cause I mean, that's how I kind of feel with any instrument that I play. Cause I've never like completely dedicated myself to it. I've always been like a jack of all trades producer. <laughs> mostly engineer you know what i mean that kind mm -hmm. of thing so it's like when you go up against like people who like you know when you play against some or not against but when you play with like guys who they know their tone their sound they've got their special settings on their amps and everything literally for their sound 
Exactly. Like, I need to do that. Like, <laughs> <but> yeah, I <laughs> just I like too many things, man. Like, you know, I just I'm just. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Like, I I tried to like learn the keyboard. I remember like my my mum. I begged my mum for um, piano lessons when I was like six years old, wow. and I I did I did piano lessons, and um, after like three weeks, I was like, I hate it. I don't like it. And she was like, <laughs> No, that's not how life works. You know, um, you have to do it because you you made a commitment. So she made me do it for six months, and she was like, After six months, you can choose if you want to do it or not. And I literally hated every single lesson for Are like, like six months. I don't know what it was. Was well, it like, I don't know, you know, scale. Uh, and... I don't know. I think sometimes I just like re to rebel against authority. You know, I do. And it was like, I just didn't want to do it. Like, I couldn't even tell you why. I wanted to be a piano player. Maybe I just, I didn't want to put in the work. Like, honestly, I couldn't tell you why. But it, that instrument didn't, yeah. I didn't have an attachment to it in the way that like I found with trumpet, for example, you know. Um, but yeah, I, even like all of these years later, like I've been to college, I've done a music degree. I had a keyboards module in my degree that I had to pass, like, which I did. And, you know, I, I, I was yeah, able to I've play. I've heard some songs where you play keys. Yeah, but like, I cannot play actually key. play keys. Like, I actually can't, like, yeah. I don't know. I think there's, there's also certain instruments that like people resonate to, you know. I tried drums for a year. I can't play drums, I'm just not a drummer. I've got a bass here. I can't really play bass, you know. I'd love to be able to do all these things, but really, what I'm good at is is singing, is right, is writing, songwriting, and um, I have an interest in production, but I don't have like a really solid foundation about kind of music, like just sound in general. Yeah, because um, I was going to so say with I, all I those little things, production people. is probably a, bit, a good avenue, because that's kind I of how them. I managed to tie in the fact that I don't play them like to a particularly high standard but I can play you know like mm. the fact that I kind of did engineer sound engineering and then music production like now I can kind of use these because you can teach you know what I mean when you're at home in your studio I can play a line and then make it sound good or I can do a solo <laughs> and yeah. you know sometimes I'm sometimes I'll come up with the most amazing piano solo just on a one take kind of thing just because you know you're not under pressure and it's not like yeah, live and it's not like, exactly you know what I mean? so I completely get yeah, that yeah I do Maybe I mean, I love, yeah, I love, I love production for like the fact that you can use these tools to improve what maybe you're not so sk skilled at, or, you know, if you have a certain way of approaching something, for example, like if I'm going to write some chords, do you, I, I, I literally just kind of sit there until like something comes out. I don't think about like what key I'm in. Okay. I don't think about where it's going to go. True. Most of the time, that's how I kind of do it. I just like, until I find, I just kind of mess around until I find something I like. But then, you know, that like basically taking a limitation and using um, like the tools of production to expand on that limitation, I find, you know, really interesting. Um, and yeah, something that I like to do in production too. It's like, okay, cool. I don't know how to do this. So I can only make this in this way. What, what can I then make from that? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, mm. like, the way I work is, like, I kind of, if there's anything I need someone else to do, I find collaboration helps a lot when you're mm. doing as well. I mean, I, I still make stuff. Say again? What's that? I said collaboration is key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so mean, key. there's lots of things I can't do, so I find ways or, you know, I mean, if I need a sick guitar solo, I'll try play it. If I can't play it, I'll just, I mean, I know so many musicians, I'll just be like, yo, you know, you do it, <laughs> send it back to me and then I'll just put it in and he's like, yo, that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just off that, man. Like, so tell us about, um, what was uh, little Yasmin like? What was young Yasmin say like uh, from moving into the teens and then late teens and what were you like? like then? <laughs> little Yasmin, little Yasmin was, as a child, I was like, I was quite shy and quite sensitive. I was quite worried as a child. And I also right. felt like I always knew more than what I was being told. <laughs> That's interesting. You know, and I always, uh, I don't know, as a child, I was, I mean, I wasn't like super socially awkward, but I was definitely shy. You know, I was kind of quite timid and I was like cautious, let's say cautious. I was quite cautious about things. I'm cautious about situations, always trying to kind of like figure out what was going on and what what was going on that I wasn't being told. 
Mm. I think that was like a, a theme, that's been a theme. And I'm still like that. I'm still like, you know, in terms of kind of spirituality and philosophy, I'm always like, what does this really mean? You know? Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I've always been kind of musical. I've also had like musical parents. So it's always been an interest for me, music. As a teenager, as many teenagers do, I got I got, got quite rebellious, to be honest with you. I was a bit of a handful, um, to as put it <laughs> lightly. I'm going to put it lightly like that. I was a bit of a handful. But um, luckily, I came out the other side. Um, luckily, I came out the other side. I mean, I was, I think because I was, I was quite, like, sensitive and quite, um, you know, insecure a little bit you know mm. anxious and um, I think when I got into my teens I really tried to mask that because I was really afraid of people realizing that I you know wasn't this like tough person um which is definitely how I wanted to be perceived I wanted to be perceived as somebody who knew herself who you know wasn't afraid to say it how it is mm -hmm. who could like express herself and like inside, I really didn't feel like that. I was like, who am I? What's going on? Like, I'm super nervous. Like, there's all these things I want to do, but I'm held back by fear. So I think, you know, we do that. I think, you know, as people, we, we kind of put on a little bit of a persona when, when things feel hard for us, you know, and, um, or I do anyway. Yeah, uh, I, so find yeah that, I find that really interesting. Mm. I find that really interesting because to me, it sounds like therapy, you know, it sounded like you were actually, um, you know, facing your fear of being, you know, nervous or scared or whatever and stuff. And by putting on that mask and facade, mm -hmm. you kind of dealing with what you were actually going through. And I mean, it might not seem that way, but it, it like, maybe it pushed you on to becoming who you are now. You know what I mean? Like, you may feel like it was a mask, but then do, I mean, we all wear masks, so that is us in, in essence, isn't it? And you're a performer, you perform on stage, man. You perform in front of loads of people and stuff. And like, so we need oh. the mask. We need the mask. <laughs> what yeah. would we do without the mask? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain, I mean, looking back on my teens now, I can kind of say that's what I was doing. At the time, I wouldn't have told anyone that, you know, so it's like, yes that was that was a tool it was a coping mechanism but at some point you know i i've never really been very good at asking for help no, okay. so, and i've always been kind of like you know independent i want to be independent and like that word has kind of haunted me because it's got both sides of the coin hasn't it like it's great to be independent but also don't be independent to a fault and i think in my teens like a lot of teenagers you know we don't feel like we can talk to anyone we feel like we're misunderstood and nobody knows and you know i also just didn't really know how to ask for help so you know i tried to escape my situation in lots of ways which were actually quite damaging in the end and quite destructive that's well, something we do in our teens you know it's not like well, like alcohol I, and drugs and that kind of stuff or... yeah and just kind of you know yeah yeah a bit of alcohol and drugs and I mean more you know I would kind of disappear and not disappear for like days on end but like you know I, I would want to escape so I would kind of you know be quite um just like what's the word reckless a little bit reckless you know and like this is a teenage thing it's you know it's not like I was <laughs> the worst of the worst you know <laughs> i don't want to give everyone a de like terrible impression of me as a teenager but you know to some extent we all kind of do that um but yeah it it, it got to a point where i really kind of didn't know where my life was going to go i really didn't and i think my family also were like worried you know it was like what you know is she going to finish her, finish her gcses is she going to get an education you know is she going to end up like teenage pregnancy no <laughs> nothing bad about teenage preg pregnancy but that was a fear you know mm -hmm. for people for my family you know because they're like oh my god what what is this been doing and oh, um, navigate that and i was self-harming as well and well basically what happened was yeah i had a suicide attempt when i was 15 and that was kind of like the catalyst for change because at that moment you know i was hospitalized so there was no, I couldn't hide and I couldn't like 
not ask for help anymore basically I needed help because I was in the hospital I was getting help you know so yeah it, that was like the catalyst for change and like I'm really lucky to have a really beautifully supportive family I've got a mum um and her wife who is also my mum because they've been together 22 years um whose name is Buki and my dad um and his wife also but like at that time like the three of them basically came together to where I was in hospital and you know all of these things had to come out I had to talk about what I was going through I had to talk about my problems I had to talk about my pain I had to basically say I do need help and you know I don't want to run away from you trying to help me and that's I mean it's a teenage thing sometimes that happens you know it does feel like a fight with your parents and they're just trying to love you and you're just trying to find yourself yeah that's but it becomes this huge battle and like I think you were talking about this with Marissi like on the last podcast a little bit well you had like you had talked about he had touched on it a little bit but it's like I'm so lucky and I'm so blessed to have to have really supportive parents and regardless of the difficulties and regardless of the obstacles that we've gone through you know like every family I, I'm so lucky like to be loved like that and I think at that time that was I had to acknowledge their love and I had to ask for their help you know and be vulnerable and it's hard that's to be vulnerable point, yeah that's a really key point and I mean I'm a parent as well so like you're giving me some mm. serious key insights I mean like that's it says a lot I mean like me too I was a I was a, I was a I was a terrible kid like I mean I used to do the not same I used to just go away and like just like be away for weekends and stuff and not come home and you know just like completely disobey like like you said a rebel and like I was completely rebellious as well just so do the opposite of everything that is supposed to be you know I didn't like punk school and uh, just you know just smoking loads of weed and drinking and going out and partying and like same thing like am i gonna pass and you know gcse's all that kind of stuff or matric in south yeah. africa but yeah so i suppose like that is a key thing a lot of people that probably don't make it through that period of say 13 14 to maybe 21 22 is like people who don't have those support systems in place yeah you know yeah so where were you in in Brighton or where did you grow up in? No, I was in London. I grew, grew up, up in, in London. London, North London, North London, North London, <laughs> North London, Sam. Oh, so no, no, I'm yeah. <laughs> no, Arsenal. Um, yeah, like so, really close to Arsenal, actually. That those kind of ways, Finsbury mm. Park kind of area. Um, all the way road and that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all okay. of that. Yeah. I love, yeah. I love North London, obviously. <laughs> me too. I mean, it's my hometown so it's what I know you know but it's what I've known um to be my home you know so can't can't not love not love North London um and um, yeah I'm back here again um I left for a little while and now I'm like back in this area I've been back in this area for like two years but after a period of like 10 years not being yeah. in North London Maybe so London. yeah it's cool man it's nice so I'm assuming that you didn't have too many issues like with coming out you know um well that's funny you say that mom. because actually i did i had huge issues with coming out massive yeah. issues even though your mom and, was gay and that like, you know? so yeah so my mom is a lesbian so my mom and dad got together and then when i was two years old um they broke up and my mom kind of discovered her sexuality at that age um so I grew up always being told, you know, you love who you love. Some women love men, some men love women, some men love men and women. Some people just love like people. And you know, it just, love is love. I was always told love is love and it's the same everywhere. It's the same, you know? Um, and it's just different people's kind of preferences. Just is, the, that is just the way that it is. You know, people are different, um, but it's all fine. Um, and so in primary school, I guess like my classmates and stuff kind of knew that my mum was a lesbian. I talked about it a little bit. It was never really any problem. I knew it was different to most people's families. Um, when I was really young, I used to wish that my mum and dad would get back together. But by the time I was like five, I worked out, you know, that's never going to happen. That's not what it is. And I had some kind of acceptance about that. Um, and I guess like when... 
so I went to secondary school and I actually went to an all girls school. Mm. And I suppose like in terms of my sexuality, I grew up wondering if I would like boys or girls or both. I wondered about it. And I never, and I always kind of was like, I don't know, I just like wondered about it. And I suppose at some point I realized I was attracted to both men and women, like boys and girls. Um, so like to put a label on it, I suppose you could call it bisexual. I'm not like a huge, the hugest fan of labels, but sometimes they're just, you know, you, you need them for a description. I'm, yeah, you know, I'm not against it. Uh, but like, yeah, if I had to like define my sexuality, I'd say I'm bisexual. Um, but when I was growing up in a secondary school full of girls, I did not have the guts to be like, I think I like girls as well. I just didn't. I just really didn't in a kind of teenage environment. There's lots of like my friends, if they didn't see homosexuality as like a problem, a lot of their families did just because it was a kind of cultural yeah, thing. Course, yeah. And um, I mean, no, I remember one girl in my whole year came out as bisexual in year 10, I think it was. And she just got vilified for it. She got absolutely vilified. And I wasn't courageous enough to kind of take that stand. And what I did do in school is talk about my mum's sexuality. And I remember like, when I was in year seven, I like made this petition, like all this like, yeah, it was like a petition. Not a petition, but like I made this thing and I was like, this, cause I don't know, like I had told someone and someone had said something to someone else and then someone had come back to me and been like, oh, well, she says she's not gonna be a friend because your mom's a lesbian or something like that. And I was just like, well, let me just, let me just like, you know, put the bottom down, the bottom, the bottom line down right now. So I like wrote this thing for my whole tutor group of like, this is the situation. If you've got a problem with it, then come talk to me. And if you haven't got a problem, then just sign your name so I know who my friends are. Like, <laughs> literally I did. And everyone in the whole class signed it apart from this one girl. And I was like, cool, she just won't be my friend then. Cool, everyone else is my friend, so cool. Just get on with it, innit? Just get on with it, just don't be my friend. You know, it was like that. And um, yeah, at some point, like the whole class kind of pressured her into being like, you can't judge someone for the way that their mum is. And uh, yeah, she signed it too. So <laughs> I don't know, like, that, that was my way of like tack tackling the issue. Oh, the but, pressure. <laughs> you know, but I, w I wasn't courageous to kind of come out and say, say you know talk about my own sexuality I wasn't I wasn't courageous enough to do that and also when I was like 15 16 I started going to church and that actually made me question my own feelings about my own sexuality about my mom's sexuality yeah tell me about that and that's that's interesting I always love all that yeah. because yeah so, I started going to like a Pentecostal church and actually that was a huge reason why I was able to leave that period of my life where I was being so self-destructive as a teenager and being all rebellious and like so you got saved you know. yeah yeah man I got saved totally got saved you, you put and your hand up and you went down and you they I've got baptized you yeah baptized I, got baptized. I got the full baptism mm -hmm. like full submergence the Holy Spirit. okay Bless. yeah yeah about a year after going to church yeah it honestly changed my life mm. um, I stopped everything apart from smoking cigarettes at that time so i stopped drinking and i stopped smoking weed how old were you i was like i think i was 16 at that point about 16 yeah mm. so yeah i started going to church just before just before my gcse okay and uh yeah what a great time honestly and that i mean that whole story is just like it's so I love that story, but it's long, so we won't talk about it. Like yeah, I like it because I mean, that. I've I've been through similar, like, and and yeah. I can completely relate. Yeah, I used to be like yeah. a leader, and like I was heavily involved. Like, and for me, mm -hmm. the way I look at it was, it was all part of my um, my spiritual growth. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I've made peace with Jesus now and stuff like that. I went through a phase like after that whole Pentecostal vibe because I grew up in a what they call a congregational church, which is very old school and, you know, mm -hmm. like, but still lovely, like, you know I mean? Like, everyone, white hats, like covering Yeah, people wear hats and, you know, like, kind of more like, if you think of like, a, I mean, it wasn't as happy clappy, like, you know, singing out loud, people would sing off their hymn sheets and stuff, but still like, yeah. you know, nice community vibe, everyone knows everyone, you know, like, 
I was the kid who always had the lead roles in the in you know the the plays and would sing solos and that kind of stuff. So all the old people loved me. But but did later, you grow I'm, up in church from like from yeah? Did you like grow up in church? Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, I mean, much, like I always had to go like, when you were young. Yeah, yeah. I always had to go, and like for me, it's not that. I, I mean, I'm glad for it, but like it created this you know, God is watching you kind of vibe in my life, throughout <laughs> my life, like right up until when I was like much older, like in my, like 18 and I started, you know, experimenting with drugs and stuff. I could always have this thing, you know, like mm -hmm. being watched, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> my mom, like she forced, well, we were, for, we had to go to church on a Sunday. Yeah. So, like, even though I was partying or doing stuff or going out, like I'd still have to go to church. So like, mm -hmm. I could never like, enjoy myself a hundred percent you know what i mean like if yeah. you go out on a saturday night i was like oh fuck it. i always have to go have to go to church tomorrow morning i mean mm -hmm. but even if i was like fuck i'd come home like drunk and shit or whatever and stuff i'd still have to go to church on sunday morning <laughs> you know, so i understand <laughs> that hungover but, church that yeah. hungover church sunday oh <laughs> you know i i did some like when i got into like darker drugs and stuff later on in my life like in my early 20s and like trying acid and stuff i remember coming home I on acid one morning and because of this vibe mm. I went to church with my grandparents like and I was still high on acid and shit like that just like tripping <laughs> out man tripping balls like <laughs> oh my god an acid trip in church no I can't even I can't even imagine but my Pentecostal <laughs> thing happened after that I was about okay. 23 or 24 when I like got <laughs> saved and you know I went into this thing but it took it took like a year for it to work out to my system for me to understand like yo this is not mm. for me. this Hello? is like yeah yeah I'm there. we're back yeah no i mean it took me like a year to figure out um this is not for me mm. and uh it helped me like and then i started delving into like all sorts of spirituality taoism Rastafarianism, yeah. and i just started mm -hmm. reading reading loads i was like the internet was on like the job i had we had unlimited internet, so I was just like, okay. you know. <laughs> but I mean, what was it like for you, that whole uh, experience? Like, um... Well, I mean, the way that I, I didn't grow up in church at all. I was kind of brought up as like, my dad's an atheist and okay, my mom's like, like, no. uh, an agnostic kind of spiritual believer in otherworldly ethereal things, but not exactly sure what, you know, like she does some tarot and stuff like that. Um, you know, and so I just kind of got told, like, you get to choose what you believe. And, like, this is a beautiful gift yeah, for anyone's life. But the other side of it is feeling like I don't know what to believe. Because if I can choose, then nothing can be real. You know? I suppose that that's an understanding you have to come to at some point anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. But I think for me, like... I always like wanted something to believe in. Also like in primary school, <laughs> I, like it was cool. Like Christians were cool in my primary school. I don't know, like there was this one girl in my class, she was like the most popular uh, girl and she was a Christian. So like, therefore I was like, oh, that's cool. Like I want to have that, you know? It was like the cool thing. Like Rock, most people were cool. uh, So <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I didn't really like, basically one, night one morning one sunday morning very early in the morning i got a phone call from a friend of mine <laughs> and um i had actually been out all night I hadn't slept i'd been with my friends we'd been drinking we'd been walking around Hampstead heath and i just got in my door like i just got home to my mum's house i snuck in my mum didn't know that i'd been out so i snuck in and i was about to go to bed and i got this phone call and she was like Yasmin, do you want to come church with me? And I was like, <laughs> you, have you called the wrong number? Like, what? And um, and she's like, oh, I, don't, I just don't want to go to church. But my sister said, like, I can bring a friend. Like, she'll come and pick them up. Like, do you want to come with me? And I was like, no, I don't want to come to church. Why would I, why would I of all people, want to come to church with you? <laughs> like, like, if you come with me, like, we'll go to a green after. Like, we'll go shopping. Like, we'll have a nice day. Like, my sister will come and pick you up. And I was like oh man like should I do this and I was just feeling spontaneous so I was like you know what okay cool or like something in me said you know or spirit said to me hey I think mm. you should say yes and um so I asked her what to wear and she told me got changed and she picked me up from the house 
And like on the way, she was like, by the way, like it's a Pentecostal church. And I was like, okay, cool. That's fine. You know, it's central walk, London. Walk. no, it was in, uh, it was in White Hot Lane school actually. Okay. <laughs> it was in a school, it was a little bit ghetto. No, it wasn't ghetto. They were, they were between buildings. So, I mean, it was in a school for pretty much the whole time that I went there. But basically, yeah, I just kind of got that. There was the gospel music in the car, like playing as we go. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is cool. Like, I like it, you know, amazing music. <laughs> and um, I got there and, you know, it was an experience because I'd never, I'd never even been in a church apart from like for a funeral. I'd never even been to any church service, wow. like any denomination. I'd never been to one. So I didn't know what to expect. And um, yeah, it was amazing. Like overwhelmingly uh, welcoming and like just this kind of warm spirit and the music, the music took me, like the music got me. And like, as we were singing all the music, I would just, I was like, oh man, I wish I knew these songs, you know, so I could, so I could properly sing along. They had the words and I was joining in and, you know, we were having a great time. And at the end of the, at the end of it, um, I felt a little bit lost in the sermon, not going to lie, um, but also felt like some of it really spoke to me. And I was like, wow, like, I feel like someone else is speaking to me. You know, that's how I felt. I felt like there was a message there for me. I felt like I was meant to be there. I felt like, um, you know, I just felt something come over me and I knew I wanted to go back. And at the end of the service, um, the pastor came over and he said some things to me, which I won't repeat because they're quite personal, but he said some things to me. And like I've since kind of being in church and then leaving, I've, I've thought about this, like, oh, is that the sort of thing that they just say to everyone feels like they resonate with? And, you know, I've tried to like intellectualize that mm. and try to like really understand like, oh, is that how he got me kind of thing? And it's like, <laughs> like, maybe but also no like it actually doesn't feel like that and it didn't feel like that but he kind of you know I can see both sides of it um but basically he said some words to me which made me think yeah I'm, I'm gonna come back and one of the most important lessons that I learned in church is was true forgiveness true forgiveness true and like the thing is I was in such a state I was so kind of damaged at that point that I was looking for a family outside my family. I was looking for some kind of different hope. I was looking for a new way to, new rules to live by so I would have a better experience of life, you know? And and that was all of those things to me. Um, and yeah, I stayed in church, like dedicated, like Monday was Bible study, Tuesday was choir, Wednesday was youth, Friday was, um, you know, another Bible study. Saturdays you know what I mean and then I'm singing on the altar on the Sunday you know so it became very much oh. my life all encompassing and I stayed for about a year and I got a boyfriend and I wanted to live with him and I did live with him and they were like yo this is not how you're supposed to live your life and I was like but I want to and don't think it's bad and um that was kind of the end of that was the beginning of the end of me, my like being in love with the Pentecostal church. Mm. Um, but I still speak to a lot of those people now. I made some lifelong friends in church. Um, and still go to church? What's that? You still go? Um, now and again, I do go to a church service. Yeah, I do, because I like to. Um, not necessarily that one, but um, yeah, every now and then I like to, I think you know, churches are spiritual places, like any, any religious building, you know, holds a kind of energy, and um, it's a lot I about intention, you know. and I believe in prayer, uh, so yeah, sometimes I go and do church stuff, but I think, yeah, sometimes the religion can get in the way of spirituality, and that's kind of what it was for me, um, but yeah, you, um, a significant part of my spiritual journey too. Do you like subscribe to any belief now or do you like i mean i know you've been through lockdown you've been giving us some really good inspiring quotes and stuff <laughs> and you've been very positive and doing some good things yeah. which is, which i find is the essence of what the religions try and teach us you know it's like yeah everyone can do whatever the hell they want to not like whatever yeah. the hell they want to but like 
I find like with me, I learn, I did a podcast with my uncle mm. recently as well. And he is like, he studies Sanskrit and, um, mm. you know, like he's, he's heavily involved in that. And I mean, he comes from the same, but obviously as me, like he's my, my mom's elder brother. So mm-hmm. grew up in the same kind of vibe with the church and stuff, but he also was like a bit different. But besides the point, like the, the point I'm trying to make is like he left like certain keys for me that affected me far more than any like yeah. religious text yeah. or thing. Can, that yeah. really, you yeah. know what I mean? Like there was like he had these pictures in his room that I used to stay in because he had moved out. He was like married and stuff. So I used to live like go and live with my grandmother quite a lot. Mm-hmm. And he had these two messages on the wall. The one was like um, a quote from Khalil Gibran which mm-hmm. was, uh, think not, you can guide the course of love for love, finding you worthy shall guide your, um, you know, shall direct your course. And the other one was like, uh, the serenity prayer by Mother Teresa. Mm-hmm. It was like, you know, accept the things you cannot change, courage to change the things you can, wisdom to know the, the, the difference. And it's weird because like, I never actually physically internalize those things. I used to just lay on the bed, like I come home drunk or high or whatever and stuff and just lay there and I'd see these things on the wall. And then years later, these things just stuck with me and they like actually resonated so much when I did start like on my spiritual path, you know, there was, and there were like things he'd give me books or like he gave me a book at one time and like I read and these things like just completely changed my perspective rather than, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? Because you can get so lost in, like you say, the religion. Mm. I feel like these people, um, Buddha, Jesus, Maybe Muhammad, you know, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, but I've been doing lots of research on that. But like, you know, these, these guys who are prophets or whatever, like, and um, yeah. they come with a message. I just mm. feel like as people, we just kind of misinterpret what they're trying to say. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like they're saying like, yo, you have the power as well to do what I'm doing. So like, I'm trying to lead by example here. You don't have to like, you know, write down. Cause I mean, Jesus didn't write the Bible. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I feel like action speaks far louder than anything else, man. You know, like how you live your life. Even with my kids and stuff, I'm trying to like instill that way of not do as I say, but do as I do kind of vibe. So, like, yeah, you know, yeah. I do things like I'll be doing yoga or meditating in the morning and they'll walk in. And I won't say any, I won't say, like, yo, you must come and sit next to me and join me. But I know mm-hmm. that, like, when they grow up, they'll have this picture of seeing their dad every morning or whatever. You know, and it that might, it beautiful. might inspire them or might, might not, but they'll have yeah. it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's how I feel about that. Yeah. No, Just like creating that environment that they are basically being conditioned by. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it is true. We are all conditioned by our environment. So it's, it's like, true. okay, cool. What environment do I want to do? What do I want to have for them? You know, if I do meditation every day, I don't think that's a bad thing, you know. I leave loads of musical like instruments around the house, you know, like yeah. there's lots of guitars and stuff. I don't ever like, you know, I'll mention like, oh, if when my daughter asked me, I showed her how to play an E chord and then she was practicing, mm. she, she was really into it for a while and she got bored and I was like, yeah, cool. But you know, like if you want to do it, there will be a stage where I'll probably like try and, you know, get her to do some lessons and stuff. But like just having things there. Oh, you know, is she now? She's like four, five. Seven. 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 I know, right? You kidding me. Yeah. Oh my God. Siri yeah, five minutes from fast, eh? Yeah. <laughs> wow. The youngest is gonna be three. Wow. So I've got seven, four, and three right now. <laughs> Mad thing. That's crazy. Yo, where is life? Where's life going? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, when you said five years months. since I met you, like in Brighton. That's what I mean. Like five years already. That's right. And it's so weird. Like the the stories that you're telling me, kind of. Um, is making me understand things better because when I met you, you were still with your previous partner in Brighton. But mm-hmm. at that time, like I obviously wasn't from Brighton, but like I just kind of gravitated to you guys, and I always just chilled with you and sat and we had drinks and you know we spoke. And I was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I felt cool. Whereas like some of the other guys, I don't know if it's because of the age thing or whatever, but like I just never mm. you know, sit down and chat with them and stuff. And I always kind of felt like a you know, just an easiness about the, you know, the conversation and the way it was. Because yeah. I mean, I'm that kind of guy, just like private. Right I'm that kind of girl as well. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we made that kind of track. Like, it's cool. It's cool. Yeah, man. Well, yeah, man. It's been cool. When's the last time that I even saw you as well? Was it Ronnie Scott's? Yeah. Um, Maurice, the last time. When me and Maurice, when I played with me, when I was that playing this year? 
That was in uh, December. December last year. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. I think as like well. for me the time oh, yeah. period between now and December seems so short because of lockdown. It feels like those That's six months insane. is really quick, do you know? <laughs> Honestly, it's like it's sometimes like time is such a weird thing. Like time is an illusion, right? Yeah. But like time oh, man, this year, I mean, I know it's so cliche to like have the conversation, but it's true. It's just gone like in one way so fast, you know, because I think, you know, what so tell me, how has it been like, I mean, I wanted to talk about, like, did you, from that, you know, with 15, and then, did you ever have any bouts of, like, dealing with depression or mental health or anything? And, like, what was this year like for you in terms of that? Because it was a time where mm -hmm. it's pretty prevalent right now. I mean, mental health cases, yeah. suicides, all that shit, like, did it affect you in any way? Or what was it like? I mean, the, my first case of depression, my first bout of depression was when I was 12 years old. So... Um, you know, I've, I've battled with depression on and off my whole life, pretty much all since I was 12. So, and also anxiety. And there's been different moments in my life where I've really battled with it much more than other times. And at the end of my last kind of serious relationship, I was in a really um, kind of bad way in terms of mental health. And I knew that. And I kind of said to myself, I need to go on this journey um, of kind of self-discovery and really about, it was more about self-love. I needed to love myself because um, I, I, I was so disconnected from myself and who I was and what I could be. And I was so wrapped up in anxiety and um, also a kind of a very destructive relationship you know, both ways, but I had a lot that I, I just didn't even know how I was going to deal with it. Um, I just knew I had to get out of that relationship and I had to focus on myself. Um, so I think that was really the kind of the turning point for me, really deciding to take responsibility for my, for my life and for my mental health, uh, like properly, you know, in a like really proper way like in a dedicated way because so I guess before that I'd kind of been in relationships I'd never said to myself oh you need to be on your own and after that relationship it was very clear to me that I needed that and I think you know it's different for everyone I'm not saying you know it, the cliche of like you have to love yourself before you get in a relationship I think it's different for everyone some people get into relationships when they're 14 year old and they're 14 years old they stay with that person for their whole life like there's nothing wrong with that you know, but for me personally, I had kind of never really had that time to really focus on myself and choose myself and um, put myself first in that way and get to really know and love myself. Um, so that was like five years ago. So that's the start of this bit of my journey. Mm. Um, so I think over the last five years, I've found a lot of tools which help me some of that is like talking to people talking to a professional if you can is one of the most beneficial things i think anyone can do and like the type of therapy depends on the on what you're experiencing the therapist depends on you know your personal connection all of those things it's not like you know if you go to therapy everything's going to be okay it's not that simple at all but I think you know, the right therapy for the right person is one of the most underrated things. I think, honestly, like if I, if I ran the country, uh, we'd all be free to like a certain amount of therapy every year, no. you know, because I just think it's good for our mental health to just be in touch with what we're doing and have somebody there who also can, you know, at a little bit of a distance, help you work through your problems because we've all got problems, you know, and, and it's about changing your really mindset. Good. What's that? I think at more time, it's just like someone just listening, you know, like literally just yeah. giving the space to listen and really showing that they care or, you know, just showing that they mm. understand what you're going through, you know. No, because you've been a shining light in the, uh, in the lockdown period. Oh, thank you. I mean, Definitely. Some, like the, a lot of the tools are kind of, for me, I use affirmations a lot. I use affirmations in my, in my, in my daily kind of, life um to affirm things that i i know that are true but maybe i don't always feel 
you know i don't always believe if i don't remind myself that they're true you know um things like i can do it like i am enough you know just really simple simple things and so yeah and i think it's important to try and for me personally just in my life it, i also feel really good when i help other people it makes me feel great when i can help other people and like i know what battling through anxiety and depression feels like i know what it looks like and if i can be like a light to somebody else in their dark moment like why would i not want to do that so that's why i choose to that's why you know i try and share that kind of stuff on social media because i think we don't see enough of it we're not encouraging enough of each other with like so much of social media is based on comparison and you know comparison even of the best of ourselves and you know it's so there's so much kind of negativity amongst a lot of positivity as well mm. that i don't know i just like i find that it's important for me to have for that to be quite a lot of what i do actually put out because otherwise yeah. it feels yeah. inauthentic yeah. to me yeah. to always like self-promote and all of that stuff like i'd much rather talk about like hey how can we be nice to each other like how can you feel good today you know because we can mm. we just have to set an intention to do it and it's hard work and sometimes that's life you know but no, no, I, I, I mean you basically like because you say like there's so much negativity out there like someone mm -hmm. has to kind of help up the balance you know what i mean so that there's a good um there's enough content for people to choose from because mm. I mean, that is what we're doing nowadays is literally wow. consuming so much fucking content every <laughs> my new album is out rah, 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 my new <laughs> single is like oh my god no <laughs> i know, I, like, know. Subscribe, add, right? <laughs> I mean we all i mean we in that business like literally that is we are. and i hate yeah. it i really hate it, it but we're in it we're in it i mean like for me this podcast has been catharsis you know like literally in this is great though when you can turn your content into when your content is what you truly believe in you know or it's it's helping to represent an idea that you have which you're you're you know you want to share with the world you know i just i don't like the kind of the whole system and how it works but um, yeah, well, i mean that's the thing because yeah i mean that's something i struggled with for years because mm. first when i started music i was like a conscious hip-hop artist i was like yeah we you know we're not about the commercialism we don't yeah. want to you know rah rah stay underground yeah. And as you get older, you have to make a living. And I mean, I've got kids, mm -hmm. I've got a house, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? It's like mortgage things. Then obviously I became an engineer and you're charging people for your, um, you know, for your time and your work. Mm -hmm. So it's like managing expectation and then also trying to stay cool within this creative process while charging people for their time and your time and money. And it becomes such a schlep, man. It's like, oh, fucking hell, man. So like you say, like this is like, it's really been healing for me. Like, like you say, like I can finally, not finally, but I can represent myself in a way that is not just like buy my CD. I mean, I'm working with yeah. this artist now. I've got this new tuner, blah, blah, blah. And yes, I'll probably be talking to a lot of my musician friends, but that's why I said, I don't particularly, we will get into like what you're doing musically, but I don't particularly just want to talk about that. I want to talk about. Yeah, no, this is like so much more enjoyable than me coming on and going and you saying like, so who's influence? Who's your top three? And <laughs> then what happened? And you know, like, oh, uh, hey, I've got uh, Yasmin Hendricks on the yeah. latest single. So what's your new single? And what are you doing next? When's your next gig? Like, I don't know because there's no gigs. <laughs> <laughs> What's that been like? Because you were you were really active though. Like you used to be I out. I was being quite active. You're right. I was being quite active. Yeah, you were, you were out, man. Yeah, man. I was doing loads of stuff. Um, but I mean, it's it's been cool. To be fair, I didn't really answer that lockdown question as well. Like mental health wise, oh, yeah. I have been up and down. But actually, I found isolation super beneficial for me in lots of ways. I could see easily see the silver lining of the first kind of couple of months. Then it got hard. And then I was like having a bit of a breakdown um, and then came out of it. So I don't know. It's definitely been up and down. Um, but honestly, I feel like I've had an easy ride. I'm very lucky to live in my own space. I don't have to share with anyone. That's good for me. Um, obviously, like it can be lonely. It was a bit lonely at times as well, you know, when we were like full, full lockdown. And 
you know, and you can't hug your mum. And I also like to look after my grandma a fair bit. So that was really hard, actually. That was probably the hardest part of it was like seeing my grandma not being able to like leave the house and feeling really lonely and not being able to give her a cuddle and like yeah man because she's she's had a stroke and she finds it hard to like speak now yeah. so talking on the phone is like not really an option for her and you know her friends couldn't come around and I don't know I was already worried about her being lonely before the lockdown and then lockdown happened so that was that was quite um why difficult because I felt like... quite powerless sorry yeah, I mean what, what's your take on the whole COVID situation because like now that you're talking about this <laughs> it makes me think like because touch being close to people being around people not being able to see people's faces all these things just seems like such a massive um form of control sacrifice. even though what's that sacrifice feels like a big I sacrifice sacrifice but then it feels like control <laughs> like i feel like i'm being forced. that's what i that's what i mean it's like you know um to what degree do we um justify all of these rules yeah so like what is the effect of having a lockdown for me like the first thing i was thinking about was people's mental health and like for example if you're an addict and you go to a group every week all the groups were shut down what's going to happen you know all of this kind of psychological um uh what do i want to say rehabilitation i want to say like I want to say all of the like difficulty that everybody's dealing with men- like the mental anguish basically and the kind of psychological warfare that this whole thing has created for people who are already struggling in a struggling um, you know in using services which are struggling you know from the NHS which is struggling you know it was it felt like a lot of things were just breaking down and the wrong Oh man, it's just, I've got so much to say and I don't want to just rant about it as well. But No rant, I was, man, let's do I it. Mean, I, was, I was just really, I'm, I feel super worried. I mean, I try not to be worried about things I can't change, but a lot of my thoughts revolved around um, people's mental health and, you know, people struggling with domestic violence, having to be locked in the house, you know, um, children who are, have got special needs and they need to be in school or their you know the whole childcare situation for everyone really you know not to say oh because we need to have childcare we can't go on a lockdown it's not that simple I think all of these decisions are super complicated and there's so much misinformation that it's really difficult to really get a grasp on kind of what it is and what's happening from one week to the next and I mean honestly I don't think that now the the the, like the R rate and all of that um, kind of matches up to what we're seeing government try and kind of do. Mm-hmm. I think it is a bit of an excuse because I think governments will always use any excuse to keep their power and, and increase it. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing. And I think it's also been a really um, great tool for deflecting all of the other kind of political problems that we were going to face this year and have faced, but just completely silently. Yeah. You know? um, but I think all over the world, you can see there's a kind of, there's becoming this kind of transparency, which is taking over, um, which is great. And we've kind of seen it for the last few years because we've seen it with social media. We've seen it with like people being able to capture things and put it online straight away. We've seen it in like Twitter with like protests being able to be kind of, um, you know, organized and people being able to organize themselves without authority um, kind of yeah, in the like, way, like, you yeah. know, being being a part of that and being in a position. Um, but I think this kind of transparency that we're seeing, like the transparency of like blatant inequality and social injustice across the whole world, it's so much more transparent. And I think that was also helped by COVID because the thing is, we're all like, if the whole world is experiencing the same thing, it's actually... Um, easier to kind of see where things are, th- see where things are at in terms of not having other distractions, you know, and being on the same page in a certain sense, like globally. Mm. So I think that definitely helped with this kind of transparency. And we've seen, like, obviously, the Black Lives Matter movement. It's basically, you know, 
all of these things which are happening, what's happened in Hong Kong, what's happened in, you know, in the rest of Europe, in um, uh, Belarus, you know, we're seeing people say, uh, we see this inequality and, and we cannot stand that it's so transparent anymore. You know, we cannot, no, we cannot anything, stand yeah, it. We can't stand for this shit. You know, we can't stand it. We cannot. And I, I feel like, I mean, the kind of hopeful part of me sees that, you know, oh, you know, this is leading the way for, for um, you know, our systems to be broken down because this it's it we've always been able like the media for example and governments uh, and power structures and monarchies they've always been able to have this kind of veil you know that they put in front of the people and and because of social media and because of technology and because of evolution and because of you know globalism and because of all of these things um it's like they're finding it harder and harder and harder to kind of keep still there though keep the truth there right it's still there i feel i feel like the polarity at the moment is just like magnified isn't it and i think like that's going to continue did you know about um the the protests in trafalgar square last weekend Twenty five thousand. i did not know until the day of the uh, or the day after i didn't actually know it was happening that was not on any major news it wasn't broadcast of course it wasn't but I mean, why does this surprise us? This is the thing. Well, it does, it, we shouldn't. It shouldn't even surprise us now. And it's like, okay, cool. If this, like they're not going to tell us what we actually want and need to know. So how do we organize ourselves so we do understand mm. what we need to know? You know, own like networks and broadcast channels. That's it. And I think you know, as long as like, if people are conscious, if people are conscious of what they want to do in their life, they have all the means and tools to do it. No, it's not completely easy for everyone to do exactly what they want to do and achieve all of their dreams. But we have, you know, let's just say in London, forget the whole world, in London, right? Most people living in London have got access to the internet. They've got access to something that can record, something that can, you know, they've got access to Google, the whole internet that is the world at your fingertips. There's so many free resources and even the ones that aren't free, you can find a crack, like for real. You can literally learn like so much. You know, you can take that power, that like our phone, like it is the power, man. Like either you feed into this like social media, let me not even call so it's social media because it's not that, but you fall into like all of the distractions that you can find with the world at your fingertips or you utilize it, you know? And like, and it's hard for kids growing up now because they've got, literally all of the distractions they could ever imagine but they've also got the whole world at their fingertips Mm. you know so again polarity you know there's going to be both sides of that it's like i don't i don't imagine like a a utopia that we're kind of working towards i like to no 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 i mean obviously we'll never um, not never but i don't think there'll ever be like utopia but like i completely agree like i feel in my short time like in like especially because I work in music and because I work as an engineer, a producer, mm-hmm. I get to work with, I get to kind of stay in the scene with younger kids, like from 16, 18, and I get to work with young people. So I kind of get to see what's happening. And what I've noticed is that like 16 to 25 year olds nowadays are switched on, man. Yeah, like, they are. There's, like, there's a lot of them that are like really, they understand the choices that they can make and they understand the choices that are out there to be made. So they're very aware of themselves and what they want. Whereas yeah. with me, I was like, just like, I had no idea. Do you know what I mean? I like took me a while to figure out like, you know, who I was and what I was doing and stuff like, you know I mean? I'll be like, dealing with like 17 year old, 18 year old kids. They'll come to the studio. They'll have their money. They'll have everything. They'll tell me to invoice them. It's like, Yo, I was thinking, damn, when I was 18, I couldn't even like <laughs> tie my shoelaces, you know, I was just bunning zoots all day, like, you know? But I mean, no, yeah. Yeah. also just to kind of yeah. wanna slowly wrap, I don't wanna go on for too long. Um, yeah. I loved everything we spoke about, so, but I just wanna kind of touch a little bit on if you have any projects coming out or any music people can listen to. Obviously, you'll send me all the links and I'll put it in the description. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, I actually do. It's been cool. I started a project last year and it was going to be for one thing. And then it ended up like just having a kind of opportunity attached to it. 
And yeah, it's, it's awesome. I'm going to release uh, a single. It's my first single release with a label. So that's like a, a, a nice little checkbox. Um, and it's going to come out on the 18th of September. Uh, okay. And yeah, we're going to do an EP, I think, November. So okay. that's the next thing. So what, have you been signed? Or <laughs> is it just like a, a one record? No, it's like a, no, I'm not like, so basically I, I was working for them as a composer and uh yeah basically we got to the end of the project and rather than just like release it under a project which is like mainly for like licensing and like syncing mm. like that being the kind of aim they said as well as like doing that do you want to also release it digitally yeah. like under your name and like we'll do this that and the other and i was like well yeah why not so yeah, yeah. sick oh well, yes uh, Thank you so much um, for Thank coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been wicked. We that. Yeah, I'm going to get you back at some point again. Like, um, yeah, we can keep the conversation. Like, what I want to do with this is, like, kind of touch base with people maybe, like, eight months down the line and see, like, you know, how things have changed or progressed. I love that idea. You know, just... Yeah, like, that's, yeah. that's such a good idea. Like, such a good idea. Hopefully you're not wicked. famous or, so, like, I have to gain contact <laughs> with you or, uh, you know... I don't know, your agent is or your manager and be like, oh, Yasmin's too busy. She's on tour in America right now. She can't. Like, <laughs> well, we'll see about that. Um, maybe, you know, maybe you're not going to have time to do the, the podcast in eight months because things going to just go. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really busy at the moment anyway. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making time for it, you know. And that's why I'm trying to limit it to like, like 40 minutes, 45 minutes, well, like up to an hour. Yeah, we've gone over, hey. No, sorry. it's cool. I don't mind. Like, it's honestly, it's fine. We haven't, we had a, if, if, if it's such, if the conversation is flowing so nicely, then whatever. But I want to, yeah, I don't want it to be too long because my attention span, I mean, when I was, <laughs> and now I'm waffling. So, yeah. This has been the Other Side of the Sun podcast with uh, Yasmin Hendricks. And thank you so much once again for coming on. It's been eye-opening, uplifting. And uh, any last thoughts before I start? Thanks for having me.